Good morning and welcome to the March 2024 Pi Day, but don't get confused. <laughs> Open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, will you please introduce our agenda this morning? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning to you. Good morning, Commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear five items for your consideration. First, you will consider a report in order to create a voluntary cybersecurity labeling program for wireless consumer Internet of Things products, which would help consumers make informed purchasing decisions, differentiate trustworthy products in the marketplace, and create incentives for manufacturers to meet higher cybersecurity standards. Second, you will consider a draft 2024 Section 706 report, which, if adopted, would fulfill the Commission's statutory responsibility under Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and raise the fixed speed benchmark for advanced telecommunications capability to 100 megabits per second download and 20 megabits per second upload. Third, you will consider a report in order and further notice of proposed rulemaking that would advance the Commission's vision for a single network future in which satellite and terrestrial networks work seamlessly together to provide coverage for consumer handsets that neither network can achieve on its own. Fourth, you will consider a report in order to require cable and satellite TV providers to specify the all-in price for video programming services in promotional materials and subscribers' bills in order to allow consumers to make informed choices. Fifth, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking that would propose to facilitate the more efficient and widespread dissemination of alerts and coordinated responses to incidents involving missing and endangered persons, an issue that is particularly prevalent in tribal communities. This is your agenda for today. Today's first item is titled Cybersecurity Labeling for Internet of Things and will be presented by the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Deborah Jordan, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Jordan, please proceed. Good morning, Good morning Chairwoman Rosen Warsaw and Commissioners. Many Americans rely on smart products in their homes to make life easier and more efficient. These internet-connected products, often called Internet of Things or IoT products, can include home security cameras, voice-activated shopping devices, smart appliances, fitness trackers, garage door openers, baby monitors, and much more. But with this convenience comes risk. IoT products may be susceptible to a wide range of security vulnerabilities. That is why today we present a report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking that would create a voluntary cybersecurity labeling program for wireless com consumer Internet of Things products. Under the program, qualifying consumer smart products that meet robust cybersecurity standards would bear a label, including a new U.S. cyber trust mark that would help consumers make informed purchasing decisions differentiate trustworthy products in the marketplace, and create incentives for manufacturers to meet higher cybersecurity standards. This would strengthen the chain of connected IoT products in consumers' homes, which in turn could strengthen the larger national IoT ecosystem. Now to present today's item. With me today are Drew Morin, Acting Chief of the Bureau's Cybersecurity and Communications Reliability Division, here for the first time, and Tara Shostek, an attorney advisor in the Bureau's Cybersecurity and Communications Reliability Division. I'd like to thank the Bureau who worked on this item, Bureau staff, as well as other bureaus and offices that contributed to this item. Tara? Thank you, Chief Jordan. Oops. Thank you, Chief Jordan. Good morning, Chairwoman Rosenworcel and Commissioners. Today's report and order would establish a framework for a voluntary cybersecurity labeling program for wireless consumer IoT products. The framework is based on criteria from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Approved products would bear an easy to understand and quickly recognizable label that includes a U.S. cyber trust mark and a QR code that consumers can scan for easy to understand information on the security of the product. While the FCC's IoT labeling program would be voluntary, companies that choose to participate would be required to comply with the Commission's program requirements. 
The program would initially focus on wireless consumer-based IoT products, which would include one or more devices and the additional product components that make the product smart, such as a wireless thermostat and the app used to control it. The FCC would act as the owner of the program with ultimate control over program oversight and structure. The program would be supported by an FCC-selected lead administrator as well as cybersecurity labeling administrators. The lead administrator would, among other responsibilities, work with a variety of stakeholders to identify or develop standards and testing procedures for IoT products for approval by the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. The cybersecurity labeling administrators would collaborate with the Commission to stand up the program and on day-to-day -day management, program management, including authorizing applicants' use of the label. The QR code to accompany the label would link the consumer to an IoT product registry that provides the more detailed information about that particular IoT product. The information in the registry would be supplied by the manufacturers that are authorized to use the label and would be made available through a common application programming interface, or API. Under the application process, a manufacturer seeking approval to use the label would file an application with a cybersecurity labeling administrator supported by a test report from an accredited and recognized testing lab. Then the administrator would review the application and supporting documentation for compliance with the Commission's rules and either grant or deny the applicant's use of the label. The success of the Commission's labeling program would rely on a robust consumer education campaign and would include shared responsibilities among the government, manufacturers, retailers, industry, and other cybersecurity groups to promote label recognition, brand trust, and transparency. Recognizing the significant importance of international label recognition, the order would direct the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau and the Office of International Affairs to work with other federal agencies to develop international recognition of the label and mutual recognition of international labels. This would enable authorized users of the U.S. Cyber Trust mark to realize benefits, the benefits that an internationally recognized label can have to promote global market access. The further notice of proposed rulemaking would seek comment on proposals addressing disclosure by the manufacturer of whether the product's software or for firmware is developed or deployed by a company located in a high-risk country, and whether to require manufacturers to disclose whether the customer data collected by the product will be sent to servers located in high-risk country. The Bureau recommends adoption of this report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking and requests editorial privileges for technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench. We're going to start with Commissioner Carr. Yeah, thanks so much to the chair and for the team for all the good work on this. You know, our top priority here on the FCC, one of them, is to make sure that we have secure uh, communications networks. And the decision that we do today aligns perfectly uh, with that goal. We've worked at the FCC here together on a range of issues to make sure we have secure networks. We've started at the device layer, looking at Huawei and ZTE. We've moved to the carrier level and looked at carriers like China Mobile and China Telecom. Uh, and recently, Congress is acting as well to look at the application layer to see threats that can come from um, applications that are beholden to adversarial foreign regimes. If we don't take action there, it, to some extent, undermines all the other work we've done in the other portions of the network stack. So I think today we take another good step in the right direction. I know uh, others will have even more than me to say probably, but for my part, I just want to thank the chair for all of her work getting this across the finish line, working with our interagency partners like NIST, coordinating more broadly on this. A lot of work to get here, and thank as well Commissioner Symington for his really strong thought leadership on this, and for the chair and Commissioner Symington working together to land this one in a really good spot. So thanks to them for all their work on this, and it has my support. Thank you. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Everywhere we look, the term connected is attached to products that formerly lacked it, products that exist in all of our homes now. Light bulbs, thermostats, locks, doorbells, smoke alarms, even toasters, refrigerators can come standard with wireless capabilities and the ability to access and control the device through the internet. This innovation, though, is not costless. Far, far too many uh, IoT products include lackluster security features as of now. 
and this is a risk truly to all of us because insecure, cheap IoT products can threaten security, our privacy, the sanctity of our homes. They can allow remote access into your home, allow bad actors to monitor comings and goings, lead to data theft, or even insecure products combined to form a network can create botnets that, of course, wreak havoc. We've known about these risks for quite some time. Today's order is the culmination of years of work by the Biden administration, by NIST, government agencies, private stakeholders, and with the proliferation of connected products available, it is challenging even for the most informed consumer to confidently identify the cybersecurity capabilities of any given device. Help is on the way starting today. Once the Cybertrust uh, mark is up and running, consumers will only need uh, to look at the product's packaging to determine whether the product meets the standards keyed to NIST profile of the IoT core baseline for consumer products. For those following along, that's NISTER 8425. So that's a mouthful, but simply scanning a QR code on the product, consumers will learn more about the specific security features. And this cyber trust mark is ready to meet the moment. Stories, of course, abound of the prevalence of insecure IoT devices just last week, following another report of cheap insecure IoT devices made from China flooding our markets. I sent letters to five retailers to learn more about the sale promotion of hackable video doorbells, and I look forward to reviewing their responses. I do strongly support the order that we adopt here today, uh, and it is in great part to the hard work of the chair, uh, and so much of both leading this effort in the agency, uh, as well as the interagency, as we heard, uh, making sure that we are a good team in the cyber sandbox here is increasingly important and I think uh, the FCC and the chairwoman's leadership here has done a tremendous job. I'm happy to see a couple of changes that I'll uh, just touch on really quickly. Um, the, the first is the proper scope of this item, that it be at the product level as opposed to the device level. And so the order we adopt here today uh, does adhere to that policy cut, gets the best framework, I think, for the cyber trust mark. Uh, as, as well as what consumer expectations are going to be. Second uh, thing I want to quickly foot stomp here is the imperative that we don't place our stamp of approval on devices that um, come from uh, any of, of um, insecure places. And that includes um, anyone, any entity on our covered list, the Department of Commerce's enter entity list, the Department of uh, DOD's list of Chinese military companies. That is a imperative here to ensuring that consumers get the safety. The last thing I'd say uh, quickly is that the lead ad administrator should uh, ensure that the cyber trust mark standards are dynamic and can be updated. And so much work remains here before uh, we'll see this actually on a package, but today is a tremendous day, a tremendous start. Um, and once it's available, I look forward to the innovation and expect will occur for consumers, for the federal government. It has my very strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I'd, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to thank the Chairwoman's Office, the other commissioners, and Bureau staff for working closely with me on this item. I think that what we are voting on today has the potential to be remembered as the beginning of a new era of cybersecurity policy in our country. If your car explodes following a minor accident, or if a table saw comes loose and maims you, or if your light bulb overheats and causes a fire, you can take the negligent manufacturer to court and recover your damages. But if an attacker hacks your smart home device, let's say an Alexa, steals your financial information, listens in on your private conversations, you have little to no recourse against the manufacturer, even if the attack was only possible due to their negligent cybersecurity practices. This is because device manufacturers and software developers routinely disclaim all liability and warranties against such failures, and tort law provides few protections in the absence of physical injury to persons or property. And this issue is becoming more pointed because as the famous cryptographer Bruce Schneier wrote, 
Soon it won't make any more sense to say you're going online than if you plugged in your toaster and said you're going on the power grid. Soon more devices than not will be smart, so this is no longer a niche issue. I've become increasingly alarmed at this gap in our legal system. And in December of 2022, I first argued for using our authority under Title III to address negligent cybersecurity practices by wireless device manufacturers on the theory that hacked devices could be used to cause harmful interference. Today, we use exactly that theory to institute this program, a massive first step in bringing legal accountability to the device industry. If manufacturers want to be eligible for the U.S. cyber trust mark, they will have to declare that they have taken every reasonable measure to create a secure device. They will have to commit to a support period up front, and during that support period, they will have to diligently identify critical vulnerabilities in their products and promptly release updates correcting them. And they will be prohibited from disclaiming these promises to the consumer. So these promises will be enforceable not only by the FCC itself, but also by the courts of every state under product warranty and contract law. Importantly, this program is optional. The IoT market is incredibly dynamic and innovative and young. The risk of inadvertently stifling it with overregulation is real. So instead of imposing mandatory rules, we are setting a high bar for products to earn the right to use the US cyber trust mark and hoping that consumers and businesses begin to value that mark because it means that the manufacturer is confident enough about the security of their product and their processes for patching security flaws that they are willing to stand behind the product legally. Over time, I hope that consumers and businesses and their insurers begin to insist that the products they buy bear this mark. More work remains to be done. I want to thank the Chairwoman's Office for agreeing to a further notice of proposed rulemaking on the issue of how to handle devices that run software developed in hostile countries that will receive updates deployed from or that can be controlled by servers in such countries or that will store user data in those countries. Such devices are, of course, at high risk of being weaponized by hostile powers, uh, it is, such as China. It is incredibly easy to hide a backdoor in an IoT device and almost impossible to detect it as a good backdoor is indistinguishable from an accidental coding mistake. The House of Representatives voted to ban one Trojan horse yesterday, TikTok, and here at the FCC we need to make sure that consumers and businesses are aware if they might be buying another one. We also need to figure out how to expand this program to routers, computers, smartphones, and non-consumer facing devices generally. I hope that as we do so, we focus less on bureaucratic processes such as checkbo uh, checkbox compliance exercises and much more on requiring manufacturers and software developers behind those products putting skin in the game and stopping hiding behind broad disclaimers of warranties and liabilities if they want their product to bear the U.S. cyber trust mark. I want to thank everyone who worked uh, very hard on this item. This is a really unprecedented development at the Commission and uh, to convey my special appreciation to the Chairwoman and her office and uh, also thank Commissioner Carr for his nice compliment. Thank you. Take what I can get. Yeah. Can get. It's that easy. All right. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, Commissioner Gomez. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I really like this item. The cyber trust mark will help consumers make sense of the myriad connected devices we use in our daily lives. We conducted a highly scientific poll in my office. And just among us, we use 95 connected devices. And that's not counting the devices that we use in our work at the commission. These are just our personal devices. So this order establishes a great program for consumers, and I am about empowering consumers with information, so I am happy to support it. I also think that making this a voluntary program strikes the right balance to encourage industry and manufacturer participation, which is critical for its success. This is a great example of a public-private partnership in the service of the greater good. So thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for incorporating our edits about the program also being accessible in multiple languages, and for your visionary leadership in launching it. And thank you to the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau for thinking about every detail that will be needed to launch this groundbreaking program. And now I'd like to share my remarks in Spanish. Hoy la FCC lanza un programa nuevo, el logo Cyber Trust Mark. Eso es lo que lo vamos a llamar por ahora. Este logo va a estar en los dispositivos que se conectan al internet, como los audífonos, una televisión, un speaker, 
y, el, y ayudará a los consumidores a aprender más información sobre la seguridad del dispositivo. Me encanta este programa porque provee información importante a los consumidores. Este es un gran ejemplo de una colaboración público-privada al servicio del público. Gracias a la presidenta Rosenworcel de la FCC por considerar que la información del logo también sea disponible al consumidor en varios idiomas. And now I have a very important question. How do I get one of those logo, are they pens, stickers? Very nice. We need, we need to have those. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. And Commissioner Gomez, I think I want to run that same poll in my office. Because Internet of Things devices are all around us, and they're multiplying fast. If you buy a television, a thermostat, a home security camera, or a fitness tracker today, the odds are it's connected to the Internet. And these smart devices, they make our lives so much easier and more convenient. I mean, they mean we can watch what we want, turn down the heat when we're away, check who's at the front door when we're not home, and keep tabs on our health at all times. They're really extraordinary. Still, the device that I think of most when I think about this new world of the Internet of Things, and maybe it's because I'm a mom, is a baby monitor. My goodness, you want that to be safe. You want to know when you bring that monitor into your house to watch your newborn, that connection is secure and is not going to invite any malware or malicious activity into your home. I think parents everywhere feel that way. So what do we do about it? What can we do to make sure that the conveniences that billions of these devices offer do not come with the downside of increased security risk? How do we make sure the everyday connections in our homes are safe? So I think these are the right questions to ask because this increase in connection brings more than just an increase in convenience. It brings an increase in cyber vulnerabilities. After all, every device connected to the Internet is a point of entry for the kinds of attacks that can steal our personal data and compromise our safety. That is why today the Federal Communications Commission establishes the first ever voluntary cybersecurity labeling program for connected devices in the United States. The label is called the U.S. Cyber Trust Mark, and when it's displayed, it will mean that the device has been certified to meet cybersecurity standards. The label will include a QR code linking to a product registry that will provide consumer-friendly information. Just like the Energy Star logo helps us know which devices are energy efficient, the Cyber Trust Mark will help us make informed choices about the security and privacy of Internet of Things devices and products that we bring into our homes and businesses. We're building the Cyber Trust Mark program on the well known cybersecurity criteria developed by NIST. We're also building this effort on the existing model we have at this agency for authorization of devices using radio frequency. So we have both a framework for standards and a framework for execution. Now, to get it done, we're going to need expert partners. So we will select third-party administrators, including a lead administrator, through a rigorous selection process that will work with us on the day-to-day -day details of the program. And the administrators selected will be responsible for receiving and reviewing applications from manufacturers to use the cyber trust mark. Now, from the start, we are building national security into the program. No entity or communications equipment from what is known as the covered list is eligible for a label. And in the further rulemaking, we ask questions if, like if manufacturers should be required to disclose if firmware or software in the product was developed in a country that is a foreign adversary. Our expectation is that over time, more companies will use the cyber trust mark and more consumers will demand it. This has the power to become the worldwide standard for secure Internet of Things devices. To get to this point, we're going to have to work with our federal partners, manufacturers, retailers, and cybersecurity groups. And we're ready to do just that. So this is no small task, but it's absolutely worth it. Because the future of smart devices is big, 
and the opportunity for the United States to lead the world with a global signal of trust is even greater. I appreciate working with my colleagues on establishing this program and look forward to seeing the cyber trust mark in the marketplace. So I want to thank the staff responsible for this effort, and you might imagine there's a lot of them, and they include Stephen Carpenter, Rochelle Cohen, Josh Garrett, Ahmed Lajoui, Zoe Lee, Nicole McGinnis, Drew Morin, Renee Rowland, Tara Shostak, and James Zaguris from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Brian Butler, Dana Schaefer, Peter Murray, Jameson Prime, George Tannehill, and Krista Winikowski from the Office of Engineering and Technology. Edward Carlson, Jared Carlson, and Brandon Moss from the Office of International Affairs. Regina Brown and Sarah Stone from the Office of the Managing Director. Hunter Dealey, Matthew Gibson, Jason Kolofsky, Shannon Lipp, Jeremy Marcus Ryan, McDonald Elizabeth Muma, and Victoria Rendazzo from the Enforcement Bureau. Joy Ragsdale and Shauna Wilkerson from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. Eugene Kislev, Mac Wakala, and Alex Yankovic from the Office of Economics and Analytics. Erica Olson, Larry Atlas, Andrea Kelly, Doug Klein, Marcus Mayer, Karen Schroeder, Jeff Steinberg, and Shin Yu from the Office of the General Counsel. And with that, we will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. Commissioner Gomez. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, can you please announce the next item on today's agenda? <laughs> Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, Sorry. item two on your agenda is entitled Inquiry Concerning Deployment of Advanced Telecommunications Capability to All Americans in a Reasonable and Timely Fashion and will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau. Trent Harkrader, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And I like the clapping. You know, folks here can do it at any time. All right, Mr. Harkrader, please proceed. I thought that was for us. Okay. Uh, good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau is very pleased to present for your consideration the 2024 Section 706 report, which fulfills the Commission's statutory responsibility to conduct an inquiry to determine whether advanced telecommunications capability is being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. I'd like to thank the Bureau team, of course, for their very hard work on this item, as well as our colleagues in the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the Space Bureau, and of course, the Office of General Counsel. Joining me at the table from the Bureau are Adam Copeland, Deputy Bureau Chief, and from the Competition Policy Division, Ed Kratchmer, Deputy Division Chief, and George Weber, uh, Attorney Advisor. I'm also joined by Judith Dempsey and Stephen Kaufman from the Office of Economics and Analytics. George will now present the item. Thank you, Trent. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Access to affordable, reliable broadband is essential for full participation in modern life. Consumers rely on their fixed and mobile connections to work, learn, access healthcare, and connect with each other. But adequate broadband service is not available to a large number of Americans. This report, if adopted, would conclude an assessment that began on November 1st, 2023 with a notice of inquiry and fulfill the Commission's statutory responsibility under Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 to conduct an inquiry to determine whether advanced telecommunications capability is being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. Specifically, the report would focus the Commission's inquiry on the universal service goals of Section 706 that were defined and adopted in the report on the future of the Universal Service Fund. Those are universal deployment, affordability, adoption, availability, and equitable access to broadband throughout the United States and it would present available data regarding these goals. Additionally, the report would find that universal availability to, of broadband to all Americans is the relevant goal for determining what constitutes the reasonable and timely deployment of broadband in the United States. Relatedly, the report would find that for development to occur in a reasonable and timely fashion, it must occur in rapid fashion to not leave large groups of Americans without access to broadband. The report would also continue the Commission's practice of examining both fixed and mobile broadband deployment, finding that fixed and mobile broadband services are not full substitutes and that both are necessary to ensure that all Americans have access to broadband 
<clears throat> excuse me, advanced telecommunications capability. With respect to physical deployment, the report would adopt a new benchmark for defining fixed advanced telecommunications capability of 100 megabits per second download and 20 megabits per second upload. This would mark the first update to the speed benchmark since 2015, when the Commission set the speed benchmark at 25 megabits per second download and 3 megabits per second upload. The report would also establish a long-term fixed broadband speed goal of 1 gigabit per second download and 500, giga 500 megabytes per second upload to give stakeholders a collective goal towards which to strive and would update the short-term goal for schools and classrooms to one gigabit per second per 1,000 students and staff. With respect to mobile services, the Commission would, for the first time, include an assessment of 5G and our mobile coverage data for speeds of at least 35 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload. Also for the first time, the Commission 706 report would rely on data from the Commission's broadband data collection for service availability data. This data represents a significant improvement over the previously used FCC Form 477, and the BDC uses more precise location-by-location location information. Mobile data is based on standardized procedures, and data is subject to challenges for consumers, states, localities, tribes, and, stake and other stakeholders. The report would f uh, also find that the Commission's evaluation that telecommunications capability is not being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. Most notably, 100 over 20 megabits per second broadband service is not being physically deployed to approximately 24 million Americans as of December 2022. The data also shows that physical deployment of fixed terrestrial broadband service has not occurred to almost 28% of Americans in rural areas and more than 23% of American of, of people living in tribal lands. Year-end 2022 data show 45 million Americans act, lack access to both 100 over 20 megabits per second fixed service and 35 over 3 megabits per second for mobile 5G and our service. Finally, the report would emphasize that the Commission remains committed to closing the digital divide and will continue to take actions to promote further broadband deployment. The Bureau, uh, the Bureau requests, <laughs> the Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Thanks so much. Today's Section 706 report is the FCC's first one in three years. And thanks to the passage of time, we came to this proceeding with a fresh opportunity to grade the pace of progress that broadband providers have made over the past few years to bring Americans across the digital divide. America's broadband builders have made impressive strides, definitively so. Wireline providers are aggressively rolling out fiber optic networks with gigabit speed. 5G networks now stretch from coast to coast. Fixed wireless has become a competitive mainstay with millions of new subscribers in the residential broadband market. Thousands of satellites have launched into low Earth orbit, offering speeds comparable to terrestrial broadband. In billions and billions of dollars in federal support are flowing to close any remaining gaps. By any possible measure, we're seeing real progress in the availability of high-speed internet. If there were ever a moment, if there were ever a stretch of time where the pace, the cadence, and the speed of broadband builds would result in the FCC agreeing on a unanimous basis that broadband is, at a minimum, being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion, as Section 706 states, today would be that day. But it isn't. The more than $8 billion for broadband allocated by states and localities under the American Rescue Plan doesn't matter. The more than $9 billion awarded through the Treasury Department's Capital Projects Fund doesn't matter. The more than $21 B 
billion dollars told out to the FCC's low income in school kids programs doesn't matter. So what is today's decision really about? What it does is it lays bare for everybody to see that the Section 706 inquiry is no longer about assessing the pace of broadband builds. It's about the next month or two. It's about Title II. The reason the FCC hands the Biden administration a failing grade today on its billions and billions of dollars of effort to build broadband is because the FCC believes that doing so will unlock more powers to impose more controls on the internet. Now, none of this is really surprising, but what is surprising, or at least interesting to me, is how the FCC arrived at this conclusion. The 706 report makes three basic errors that work to obscure the state of broadband progress. First, the report relies on bad data. It uses broadband deployment statistics that are now 15 months old when newer information is available right on our fingertips and right on our website. And the numbers used in this report have inaccuracies that were uh, later corrected by the FCC. Second, the FCC reads an entirely new standard into the statute that Congress never put there. Rather than measuring the incremental progress of broadband availability, as Congress asked us to do in Section 706, the FCC moves the goalposts and undertakes an all-or-nothing inquiry using factors that themselves appear nowhere in the statute. In other words, the agency uses criteria that could never be satisfied. And third, while we all agree that the FCC should be aiming for 120 internet speeds in our programs, which we've been doing since at least 2016, the 706 report uses that benchmark to disregard the technology neutrality and consumer expectations language that Congress put in Section 706. Uh, now, my written statement, which I will spare you the full reading of here, goes into more detail on some of those points, but I'll highlight just a couple of additional ones. Let's start with the data. This is where there's a really big problem. As noted, we have these new maps, which are much more accurate than the old way that we collected it, but we use the old version 2 instead of the version 3 data set that's already available. And the FCC's reliance on stale data undermines entirely the agency's conclusions here. It discredits this entire exercise and renders its ultimate conclusions untenable as the current state of broadband availability. When you look between those two versions of the map, you may not think too much time has passed, but it's a lifetime in terms of internet bills. In fact, just look at what's happened in that intervening period between the data set we use and the more current one. If you look at fixed terrestrial availability alone, we undercount the number of units served by 120 by 6 million, simply by using the wrong version. On fixed wireless, it's even worse. There, there's 24 million units that are now served that we don't count. When it comes to this new generation of low Earth orbit satellites, it's still worse again. There's been an over 500% increase in the availability of 120 LEO service between version two that we use and version three that we should be using. On the statutory point, as I indicated, I laid out most of my view there, but in essence, the statute asked us to look at the pace of broadband. If they wanted us to make a binary call, does 100% of America have 120 or not? They wouldn't have given us 706 to do that. That would be an inquiry that Congress could do on its own. 
and I lay out some additional statutory concerns in my written dissent. And some of the mistakes that we make along the way ultimately inform the decision to adopt 120 as the new benchmark. Again, as I indicated at the beginning, I would have no objection to the FC setting a goal of 120 for our programs. And as noted earlier, we've been doing that for a number of years now. But the items treatment of the new benchmark is troubling in a couple of respects. And most importantly here, it's the disregard of high-speed broadband, 120, delivered from this new generation of low-Earth orbit satellites that we simply don't count. Similarly, the FCC relies on data about consumer adoption rates to decide what qualifies. That's not something that the law indicates we should be doing. But if it were, if we were to look at uptick in adoption rates, then it would undermine entirely our adoption of 120. Because when you look at the 120 adoption rates, even for fixed wireline broadband, it's sub 50%, in some cases even lower than that. So at the end of the day, as we adopt individual programs, of course, we need to be putting that option out there to make sure that we can get 120. But going forward, I want to make sure that we don't set benchmarks that are going to artificially constrain competition and are going to artificially create a map that makes it look that actual broadband that is available there isn't, because that leads to waste for overbuilding and other sort of inefficient administration of our programs. At the end of the day, though, for all my concerns about the policy cuts that we make on top of these data sets, the work that the Bureau does on this every go round is immense and is deeply appreciated. Wrangling all these data sets, compiling this information is no easy task. And for that, you, as always, have my thanks and appreciation. Uh, on this particular item, I'll be a dissent. Thank you. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Today, in assessing the availability of advanced telecommunications capabilities, we update our broadband benchmark to 100 down, 20 up speeds, better aligning with consumer expectations, other federal programming, and the offerings of many ISPs themselves. For the first time, we assess 5G mobile coverage data speeds, uh, of at least 35.3, and we update our short-term goal for school and classroom broadband access. I strongly support all of these steps, ensuring that our Section 706 report will continue to accurately reflect the availability of telecom capabilities nationwide. We have made great progress since issuing our last Section 706 report in 2021, but there remains much work to be done. To close the digital divide in particular, uh, I do agree with the report's conclusion that advanced telecommunications capability is not being fully deployed to Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. One of the issues that I want to focus on here today specifically is the challenge of affordability our ability to solve this aspect in particular of the digital divide is in grave peril. I'm talking, of course, about the lack of funding for the Affordable Connectivity Program. Over 23 million American households have relied uh, on ACP to subscribe to essentially free internet. These households will confront a hard choice between uh, bill shock here coming after April and disconnection. We should not let that happen. ACP has had a significant impact nationwide. Americans throughout the country and urban, rural, tribal communities are enrolled, have enrolled at the time of ACP's freeze last month. Just some few, a few numbers, over 130,000 households in my home state of Kansas 1.7 million in Florida, 186,000 in Connecticut, 470,000 in Virginia. Those are, for those following along, the home states of my colleagues here 
up on the dais. Over 329,000 tribal households enrolled as well should be pointed out. These are young learners, grandparents, everywhere and everyone in between. To put it plainly, ACP is the most effective program we've ever had, ever had, in helping low-income Americans get online and stay online. The benefits are in jeopardy. As we have announced, April will be the last fully funded month, and so without additional funding from Congress, millions of Americans are going to lose their connectivity. And uh, I expect that internet bills will, of course, be a – these are families who have and know how to stretch a dollar to work hard. But having them – $30 for their internet bill or higher, considering what folks will potentially need to pay, is just not conceivable. I've heard directly from people. Let me share in particular one story with you. Deborah was a dynamic woman, a true twinkle in her eye. She was in um, Illinois discussing ACP very recently with her. She's receiving federal housing assistance there in Lake County uh, over an hour away from her family and her church community. She told me that she, through this program, has now become hooked on her internet. She goes to Zoom Church each week, speaks with her grandchildren, her family once a week. She's taking advantage. She maps out wherever she's going to go in advance, uses MapQuest in particular to explore the community, started an online small business that she gets income from and told me, uh, I met with her just after Valentine's Day, she told me that she has joined a seniors dating community. I didn't ask her how her Valentine's Day went in particular. But I wished her, of course, good luck. But I could see her face right now just as if she's right here in the front row. And she looked at me and said, what am I going to have to give up now in order to keep my Internet connection? And she literally said, am I going to have to eat less food? And it truly should not have to be this way. The lack of affordability um, uh, is hurting us in other um, uh, public policy goals we have. I've talked long about how it's going to impact BEAD and the ability for BEAD dollars to stretch further without ACP. We're not going to be able to reach as far, penetrate as much into these rural communities that we're all very much interested in that are the 24 million American households that we're talking about in our Section 706 report as well. So let me close, uh, of course, with a note that I am and always have been an optimist. And so I am hopeful that Congress is going to fund ACP moving forward. There's good cause for hope as we all sit here today. President Biden has asked Congress to fund ACP as part of his budget, called for it again uh, uh, for this Congress. There's a bipartisan, bicameral effort to fund ACP, the Affordable Connectivity Program Extension Act. Over uh, 400 government leaders have signed on. Public interest groups support it. At the state and local level, 26 bipartisan governors have signed on to it. 174 mayors have signed on to it. Uh, it goes without saying that I stand ready and willing to do whatever it takes uh, to make sure that this proposal before Congress bears fruit. Uh, and so that next year, when we're talking about our 2025 Section 706 report, we'll be able to highlight that the availability of advanced telecom uh, capabilities to Americans everywhere has improved because of this effort. Thank you to the staff for their hard work on this item. It is so important that we continue to give the American people an honest assessment of where things stand, and you all have done that. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. I agree with everything Commissioner Carr just said, but I'd like to make a couple of additional points. I want to begin by praising this report for considering latency, the time that it takes each packet to reach its destination, in addition to speed, the amount of data that a connection can carry per second, especially as speed ceases to be the bottleneck, a point I'll return to shortly. Other connection characteristics like latency and jitter, which is moment-to-moment -moment variations in latency, become more important for improving application performance and user experience. It's high latency, not low speed, that makes video chat feel janky, that makes you lag in a video game, 
and that makes skipping to a different part of an episode so painful. It's what makes web browsing feel unresponsive. So as we drive toward better internet service for Americans, I'm glad we're going to be considering what can be done to drive down latency and make sure that all Americans can fully enjoy new interactive internet applications. This does not necessarily mean new rules or impositions on ISPs, but might instead involve initiatives with router manufacturers and Wi-Fi vendors uh, to reduce other sources of end user latency and jitter, improving the end user experience, such as buffer bloat or avoidable Wi-Fi interference. Unfortunately, despite this, I do have some issues with the report that make it impossible for me to support it. While I'm glad the report addresses the need for lower latency connections, I'm disappointed that it sets an unnecessary long-term speed target of 1,000 uh, down, 500 up Mbps. Certainly for the same price, I would take a gigabit service over a 100 down, uh, 20 up Mbps service, mm -hmm. but I don't think I would get much added utility out of it. A 120 Mbps connection is enough to watch multiple 4K video streams, make multiple video calls, and play multiple online games all at the same time. Before we ad adopt a 1000 down 500 up long-term goal and begin to de de uh, design our universal service programs around reaching it, we need to be able to articulate the use cases for such high speeds that justify making the taxpayer subsidized deployment of such service to every quarter of the country. This re report doesn't get there, and I fear that instead it sets the stage for a generation of wasteful spending. The second issue, uh, even more glaring, I'm, unfortunately, is the exclusion of satellite-based internet service from the report's analysis. Before the advent of low Earth orbit or LEO constellations, it used to be that sat satellite internet uh, had uh, too high latency for most consumer applications, and many consumers were dissatisfied with it. The, these old services were probably not adequate substitutes for wired broadband, just make dues for when no obvious alternative existed or for non-consumer use cases where the latency wasn't a problem. And if that was still what the satellite internet market looked like, we would be right to exclude it from consideration in our assessment of broadband access and affordability in the United States. But uh, to pick the most prominent example, SpaceX's LEO-based Starlink services completely changed the game. Starlink is, in fact, available at this moment in almost every corner of all 50 states and offers low latency and speeds nearing or exceeding 100 slash 20 Mbps, especially in rural areas, which are most likely to lack access to comparable wireline service in the first place. Obviously, we are only at the dawn of the satellite broadband industry and competitors and new technologies are still emerging, but present capabilities from one company are already notable, and with this morning's successful Starship launch, the pace of orbital broadband deployment seems likely to accelerate further. The report says that satellite services are limited in the numbers of customers they can serve, but I note that that limit is only a function of how much spectrum they're allowed to use and how many satellites they're allowed to launch per year, both things that the FCC has control over. If we give Starlink and its forthcoming competitors access to more spectrum and permission for more launches, and if we allow them to compete for universal service fund subsidies on equal footing with other providers, I have no doubt that they could easily offer low latency 100 down 20 up service to every household that does not already have it. So for these reasons, I'm afraid I must respectfully dissent. Commissioner Gomez. Uh, thank you. More must be done to ensure that broadband is being deployed reasonably and timely to all Americans and particularly those in historically unserved and underserved communities and consumers who live in rural, tribal, and low-income areas. And more must be done to ensure that when broadband is deployed, that it is affordable. These two pieces, availability and affordability, are key to ensuring that everyone everywhere has access to connectivity. Unfortunately, I have to agree with Commissioner Starks, um, and thank you for Thank him for his remarks. Because one of the FCC's greatest tools, the Affordable Connectivity Program, will end next month, absent congressional action. For low-income rural Americans, the ACP has been a lifeline to ensuring that they have access to connectivity. Other rural consumers have been waiting for connectivity to finally come to them. But without ACP, our nation's historic multi-billion dollar investment in broadband infrastructure through the BEAD program may not reach them. We've made so much progress, but as today's report finds, more must be done. The ACP is a key tool that is necessary to continue our progress to, con to connecting everyone everywhere, particularly those in rural and hard to reach areas. Thank you to the chairwoman for your leadership on this item and for her leadership in establishing the ACP. 
Thank you also to the staff of the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, and the Office of Economic and Analytics for their work on this item. Thank you, commissioners. In the United States, we dream big and do audacious things. We connected the coasts with railways. We crisscrossed the country with interstate highways. And we did these things because they strengthened our communities, our economy, and our national security. Today, we are engaged in the same kind of history making because we are building high-speed broadband that reaches everyone everywhere in this country. We've committed to this course at the Federal Communications Commission with our colleagues at other agencies and with Congress because we know that all of us need access to broadband to have a fair shot at 21st century success. Of course, nothing made this clear like the pandemic. After all, it was just four years ago this week that so many of us were told to head home. Life moved online, school, work, healthcare, and more, but not all of us were able to make the digital leap. Not everyone had reliable access to broadband. The pandemic exposed our digital divide in living color. This is why we are now in the bold business of fixing this divide. It's why today the commission updates its standard for broadband. Our new baseline is 100 megabits down and 20 megabits up, and that's up from 25 megabits down and three megabits up. Honestly, this fix is overdue. It aligns us with pandemic legislation like the bipartisan infrastructure law and the work of our colleagues at other agencies. It also helps us better identify the extent to which low-income neighborhoods and rural communities today are underserved. And because doing big things is in our DNA, we also adopt a long-term goal of one gigabit down and 500 megabits up. All right, one more thing. The law requires that we assess how reasonable and timely the deployment of broadband is in this country. So we do something in this report that is very simple. We are honest. Our goal is to connect everyone everywhere to high-speed broadband. But the last fully vetted and validated annual data before this agency show conclusively that we are not there yet. 24 million people in this country are not connected, including 28% of us who live in rural areas. In fact, millions of people, not just in rural areas, but also in urban and tribal communities, still do not have the broadband they need to fully participate in modern life. We're working on it. That's why we've revamped our broadband mapping at this agency. It's why we are refining our universal service programs. It's why our colleagues at other agencies have been given unprecedented billions from Congress to help build broadband infrastructure to so many places that are still without. Don't bet against us, because we are making progress. So many providers are building, and so many communities are planning their digital futures. I believe big things are ahead. So I want to thank the staff, and it's really staff from all across the agency, for their work on this report, including Allison Baker, Michelle Burlove, Brad Berry, Brian Boyle, David Brodian, Ted Burmeister, Jessica Campbell, Adam Copeland, Lisa Edwards, C.J. Ferraro, Janice Gorin, Joel Graham, Jody Griffin, Audra Hale Mal Maddox, Heather Hendrickson, Clint Heifel, Jesse Jackman, Alex Johns, Julia Johnson, Jamil Kadre, Melissa Kirkle, Ed Kratchmer, Heidi Lankow, Chris Lachlan, Jody May, Ben Nashad, Koa Nguyen, Kimma Nakirshet, Nick Page, Jordan Reth, Janae Shriver, Christy Schumann, Gilbert Smith, Simon Salami, Noah Stein, Renee Strong, Raphael Snader, Jennifer Vickers, George Weber, Eric Wu, and Suzanne Yellen. And that's just from the Wireline Competition Bureau. <laughs> Johan Barr, uh, Nicholas Copeland, Judith Dempsey, Chelsea Fallon, Lonnie Hoffman, Stephen Kaufman, Evan Quarrell, Ken Lynch, Catherine Matraves, Jeffrey Oker, Stephen Rosenberg, Michelle Schaefer, Molly Schwartz, Alexander Simmons, Donald Stockdale, and Patrick Sun from the Office of Economics and Analytics. Barbara Espin, Garnet Hanley, Jean Kidu, Susanna Larson, Susan Mort, Paul Powell, Jessica Quinley, Sayu Rajapowski, Sean Spivey, and Matt Warner from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Scott McCool and Carrie Murray from the Space Bureau, 
Ed Bartholomew, Zach Champ, Bambi Krause, Wes Platt, and Kara Voth from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Ben Bartholomew, Deg, Doug Klein, Irene Lai, Rick Mallon, Erica Olson, Karen Onije, Braden Parker, Robert Primrosh, Anjali Singh, Cheryl Wilkerson, Derek Yeo, and Shin Yu from the Office of General Counsel. And last but not least, Joy Ragsdale from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. And with that, we will have a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr? Dissent. Commissioner Starks? Approve. Commissioner Symington? Dissent. Commissioner Gomez? Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, can you announce the next item on today's agenda? Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item three on your agenda is titled Single Network Future, Supplemental Coverage from Space, Space Innovation, and will be presented by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and the Space Bureau. Julie Carney, Chief of the Space Bureau, will give the introduction. All right. The Space Bureau has to find their spaces. <laughs> we don't want to take up too much time. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Carney, please proceed. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Today, the Space Bureau and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau are pleased to present to you an item for your consideration that would advance the Commission's vision for a single network future in which satellite and terrestrial networks can work seamlessly together to provide coverage for consumer handsets that, until now, neither network could achieve on its own. This item represents a strong collaborative effort between the Space Bureau and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau with important contributions from the Office of Engineering and Technology, the Office of International Affairs, the Office of General Counsel, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and other bureaus and offices across the Commission. In particular, I would like to thank my team in the Space Bureau, as well as Joel Taubenblatt and his team in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau for their hard work on this item. And now I'll turn it over to Joel for further remarks. Thank, thank you, Julie, and good morning, uh, Madam Chairman and Commissioners. Uh, this item has truly been a collaborative effort, and we're grateful for all the thoughtful work of so many FCC staff. This item has the potential to save lives by connecting people in hard to reach places and to promote an innovative and collaborative spectral environment. Joining Julie and me at the table are from the Wireless Bureau, Carrie Hicks, Deputy Bureau Chief, Jess Quinley, Assistant Bureau Chief, and Haley Peacher, Attorney Advisor in the Mobility Division, and from the Space Bureau, Jennifer Gilsonen, Deputy Bureau Chief, and Stephanie Neville, Attorney Advisor in the Satellite uh, programs and policy division and Haley and Stephanie will present the item now Thank You Julie and Joel good morning madam chairwoman good morning commissioners this item if adopted would take a major step toward toward harnessing the power of hybrid satellite terrestrial networks to facilitate ubiquitous connectivity and would support public safety technological innovation and sharing of spectrum resources it has the potential to fill gaps in existing networks to provide connectivity to anyone, anywhere. The Supplemental Coverage from Space, or SES, regulatory framework established in this item would be the first of its kind in the world and would advance U.S. global leadership. This framework would allow partnerships between terrestrial service providers and satellite operators using spectrum previously allocated only to terrestrial services. SES would enable con consumers to be connected using their existing de devices via satellite-based communications in areas not covered by terrestrial networks. This report and order would adopt a spectrum use framework that enables expanded coverage to a terrestrial licensee subscribers through a collaboration via lease agreement or arrangement with a satellite operator. It would adopt a secondary bi-directional mobile satellite service, MSS, allocation in certain frequency bands where there are no primary non-flexible use legacy incumbents, federal or non-federal. It would authorize SES only where one or more terrestrial licensees holding all licenses on the relevant channel throughout a defined geographically independent area, GIA, lease access to terrestrial spectrum rights to satellite operators 
whose Part 25 space station license includes these frequencies and the GIA. It would adopt entry criteria that satellite operators must meet to apply for or modify its existing Part 25 space station license to operate satellites in SES bands. This report and order would also enable FirstNet to utilize SES. Now, I would like to turn the presentation over to Stephanie Neville of the Space Bureau to present the remainder of the report and order and the proposals in the further notice. Stephanie? Thank you, Haley. The report and order, if adopted, would establish a license by rule approach for terrestrial devices operating as SES Earth stations, communicating with a satellite network for purposes of SES. It would require modified or new equipment authorizations for terrestrial devices and would grant a limited waiver of certain equipment authorization rules. It would apply with limited amendments the existing service rules governing satellite and terrestrial licensees to enable the provision of SES and imposes technical rules and other recommendations to mitigate potential harmful interference to existing services, including radio astronomy. It would clarify applicable international coordination obligations and outline steps to ensure that SES operations will be consistent with relevant ITU radio regulations. It would adopt interim 911 call and text requirements to route 911 calls and texts to a public safety answering point using either location-based routing or an emergency call center. And the report and order would clarify that the SES framework remains separate from the existing framework for MSS systems. The SES framework we present today is a first step, focusing on particular SES implementations which present less complex legal and technical challenges in order to foster the rapid deployment and development of these exciting networks. The further notice represents an effort to expand on this process by seeking comment on improving 911 service for SES and on procedures related to the protection of radio astronomy. The bureaus recommend adoption of this item and request editorial privileges for technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you to both bureaus. We'll now hear comments from my colleagues. Commissioner Carr. Thanks so much to the Bureau for all the work on this. We're really on the cusp of unlocking uh, an entirely new technology that can significantly benefit consumers, innovation, and connectivity as well. You know, we've long had the capacity from space to get high-speed internet service directly to a standalone dish. Uh, we've also had the ability to go direct to the handset, historically, with sort of low bandwidth technologies. Mm -hmm. And the ability to sort of unlock uh, the capacity to blend the two of them and have high-speed service directly to uh, a smartphone device is a really exciting technology development, and I'm glad we're, we're moving forward with this decision, so thanks. <coughs> Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Just about a year has passed since we proposed a framework for launching cell towers in space. And during that time, we've seen greater promise, more rescues of hikers, crash victims, who've reached out to emergency services with a satellite text, more testing of capabilities that go beyond just texting, including the first two-way satellite to cell phone calls, first 5G satellite to cell phone call, and satellite to cell data download speeds peaking at 14 and 17 megabits. We've seen more investment to bring those capabilities out of the lab and into the hands of American consumers, not to mention much uh, great international focus, much of it galvanized at the World Radio Conference. And where we've seen promise, we've also seen pivots. Partners, uh, we've seen partners and proprietary satellite uh, to sell solutions end, unfortunately, but we've also seen analysts and executives shift away from the hype in favor of a more measured debate about the satellite to sell business plans. We've seen companies fill in connectivity gaps 
uh, the old-fashioned way, pairing them with purpose-built satellite terminals with cellular devices instead of simply combining them into a direct-to-cell solution. So the promise and the pivots here are the hallmarks of a technology that's exciting, dynamic, and fluid. And so I'm glad we're pursuing this order, and it calls a hybrid approach to authorizing SCS, and that approach creates an enduring rules-based framework for less complicated SCS deployments. And at the same time, it doesn't limit those SCS proposals to something that just has to fit the mold. It commits to a serious evidence-based look at re reasonable proposals that deserve and merit, I think, our attention, whether that meets uh, the criteria set forth in our rules or charts a different course. In other words, truly, I think it commits to not only keeping up with that promise, but with those pivots as well. And so in, in so doing, it gives um, every great innovator, large and small, those that are old and those that are new, a path to see what lies ahead. It was an important, important aspect of the framework that uh, we set forth here today. And I'm thankful that we tweaked the item to pull along all SCS players on firm footing. Uh, so thank you to the chair, thank you to the team, teams combined here. <laughs> Uh, for their hard work forging new ground quickly uh, in what is truly just in a dynamic space. Um, uh, and thanks uh, to the staff. Uh, it's terrific work has my strong support here today. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. I support today's item and share my many thanks with the staff for their hard work on it. Commissioner Gomez. Thank you. Today we continue to support the United States rapidly expanding space economy by adopting rules to enable hybrid satellite terrestrial networks to connect everyone everywhere. These hybrid networks work together to provide coverage that, as Julie noted, neither can achieve alone. They will provide life-saving connections in emergencies. We've already seen this in Hawaii and in California. But these networks will also promote innovation that benefits consumers, unlock economic opportunities for industries like precision agriculture, and connect the most remote, hard to reach areas. This framework is groundbreaking and continues to chart the path forward for US leadership in the space economy. I am proud to support this item and I look forward to the innovation that will unfold in a single network future. Thank you to the commission staff who worked on this item, including the Space Bureau, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, and the Office of Engineering and Technology. Thank you, commissioners. This is so exciting. We're fast heading to a world where next generation wireless networks are gonna connect everyone and everything around us. They're gonna open up possibilities for communication that we can't even fully imagine today. But we're not going to be successful in our effort to make this always-on connectivity available everywhere if we limit ourselves to just one technology. We're going to need it all. Fiber networks, licensed terrestrial wireless systems, next generation unlicensed technology, and satellite broadband. But if we do this right, these networks will seamlessly interact in a way that is invisible to the user. And we won't need to think about what network where and what services are available. Connections will just work everywhere all the time. This vision is what we call the single network future. And the opportunities are vast. But the path to this future is going to require a lot of steps. And we take just a huge step forward today. In this decision, as you've heard from my colleagues in the bureaus, we bring satellite and wireless communications together. We do this because their convergence can accomplish more than either network can do on its own. Together, they can end dead zones. Together, it means that when disaster strikes and destroys ground-based systems, we're going to have a backup in space. I mean, if that sounds out there, it's actually because direct satellite to smartphone communication has moved from sci-fi fantasy to reality. Now, it was about a year ago I spoke about this vision that I had for the single network future at Mobile World Congress. And when I returned for this year's event, my counterparts from across the world told me they're watching the United States closely. And there's good reason for that. 
because today at the Federal Communications Commission, we become the first regulator in the world to shape this future. We are the first country to adopt a framework that combines satellite and wireless service through supplemental coverage from space. And here's what it looks like. We've developed a framework that allows a satellite operator to partner with a terrestrial mobile carrier to get access to their terrestrial spectrum. Then the satellite system can provide service directly to the subscribers of the wireless carrier in the areas where the carrier lacks coverage. So there's no need to wait for new spectrum or a new generation of devices. Satellite operators and their carrier collaborators can use terrestrial spectrum that is already in the market to bring these services to the phones we already have today. Even better, we accomplish all of this while protecting existing networks from harmful interference by ensuring that the new supplemental satellite operators operations are secondary to mobile networks operations and by requiring that one or more carriers that hold co-channel licenses throughout a geographically defined independent area. All right, to further safely grow these opportunities, we also have a rulemaking. Recognizing that this new connectivity is powerful when it comes to calling 911 for emergency help, especially in places where terrestrial signals are scarce, we seek comment on how to enable automatic location-based routing of emergency communications, and that's important. So this is what the future looks like, a single network future. And uh, again, we had an enormous team work on this, so get comfortable. <laughs> I want to thank Melissa Conway, Carmen Etemad, Stacy Ferraro, Garnet Hanley, Carrie Hicks, Joyce Jones, Alice Cothay, Susanna Larson, John Lockwood, John Markman, Andrew McArdle, Roger Noel, Charles Oliver, Christine Parola, Haley Peacher, Paul Powell, Jessica Quinley, Jeremy Reynolds, Jennifer Salhas, John Schauble, Blaze Sinto, Joel Tavenblatt, and Janet Young from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, Greg Boren, Greg Kutras, Jennifer Gilsonen, Franco Hingenosa, Julie Carney, Jeanette Kennedy, Whitney Lohmeyer, Catherine Medleys, Stephanie Nelville, Sankar Persaud, Jeannie Pontoneri, and Marissa Velez from the Space Bureau. Bam and Badapur, Jamie Coleman, Martin Dozcat, Michael Ha, Ira Keltz, Nick Oris, Bob Pavlak, Ron Rapazzi, Tony Serafini, Dana Schaefer, Jim Saliga, George Tanhill, Krista Witnowski, and Sean Yun from the Office of Engineering and Technology, Brendan Boykin, Stephen Carpenter, Jill Coogan, Gerald Inglis, John Evanoff, David Firth, Shabir Hamid, Timothy Hoseth, Deborah Jordan, David Kirshner, Barbara Kunkel, Brian Marenko, Nicole McGinnis, Erica Olson, Renee Roland, Rasul Savavian, David Saratsky, Rachel Ware, and James Wiley from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Edward Carlson, Jared Carlson, Neshe Gundelsberger, David Hu, Dante Abaria, Nathan Lucarelli, James McLucky, and Brandon Moss from the Office of International Affairs, Kim Cook, Kathy Harvey, Jeremy Marcus, Ryan McDonald, and Josh Zeldis from the Enforcement Bureau, Deborah Broderson, Michelle Ellison, Michael Jansen, Doug Klein, Dave Konskow, Anjali Singh and Shin Yu from the Office of General Counsel, Michael Gusso and Joy Ragsdale from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, and Judith Dempsey, Catherine Matraves, Julia McHenry, and Cher Lee from the Office of Economics and Analytics. That might be a record. All right. We will proceed to a vote on this item. Commissioner Carr. Approved. Commissioner Starks. Approved. Commissioner Symington. Approved. Commissioner Gomez. Approved. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, item four on your agenda is titled All In Cable and Satellite TV Pricing and will be presented by the Media Bureau. Holly Sauer, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Sauer, please proceed. Good morning, Chairwoman and Commissioners. Today, the Media Bureau presents a report and order adopting the all-in rule to benefit video consumers by requiring cable and satellite television providers to specify the all-in price for video programming, both on subscriber bills and in promotional materials that include pricing information. Requiring an all-in price for video service will increase transparency and competition by allowing consumers to make better informed choices among service providers. Joining me at the table are Lori Moorbeer, 
from the Media Bureau front office, and Maria Malarkey and Joe Price from the Bureau's policy division. Joe will present the item. Chairwoman and commissioners, we are pleased to present this report in order addressing issues with unanticipated charges and fees for video programming provided by cable and satellite television providers. Too often video programming costs are hidden in bills and promotional materials as taxes, fees, and surcharges. The report in order adopts an all-in rule to benefit video consumers by requiring all charges related to video programming to be presented as one all-in price. The all-in rule requires cable and satellite television providers to provide an aggregate price for video programming in a clear, easy to understand, and accurate single line item, and if applicable, disclosing when and what charges are due to increase after a promotional period. The all-in rule is part of the Commission's ongoing commitment to consumer protection and customer service in the video services marketplace. The Communications Act requires the Commission to establish customer service standards to increase consumer protection for cable subscribers. The Act also provides the Commission broad statutory authority to impose public interest or other requirements on satellite television providers. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt the report in order and request editorial privileges to make any necessary technical or conforming changes. Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear comments from the bench. Commissioner Carr. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks to the, the Bureau for the work on this. I appreciate uh, where my colleagues are going with this and sort of the, the policy cuts that they're making here. I uh, part ways, though, uh, at a threshold point, which is one of, of statutory authority, as I sort of read what we're doing here, we, we should touch on four uh, separate points. Uh, we deal with sort of subscribers' bills and promotional materials for one, cable billing, two, DBS billing, three, cable advertising, and four is DBS advertising. Uh, and when I look at sort of the statutes that we're citing here, uh, I think there's a really good argument that we have statutory authority in the first piece over cable billing, uh, but I don't read the cited statutes as giving us authority to apply these regulations to any of the latter three, so DBS billing uh, or advertising for cable or DBS. In fact, as I look at the TVPA, sort of my read of that is that Congress sort of considered whether to give us that authority to go into advertising, but ultimately did not. Um, and so while I appreciate a lot of the, the policy cuts that my colleagues make here, um, I can't head down that path just given my uh, different read on the statute at issue here, so thanks. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Today we take a stand. The hard to understand asterisks and fine print that litter advertisements, bills for cable and satellite TV service will soon be extinct. We impose a simple requirement, at least simple in theory here, that these ads, these bills must include the all-in price, the total amount that the consumer will pay for video programming service. As we say back where I'm from, it makes good plain sense. In fact, in 2019, Congress passed a law requiring cable and satellite providers to provide customers with transparent pricing information both before uh, the consumer enters into the contract for video service, then in writing 24 hours after entering into that contract, and then monthly on your consumer bill. The record is clear that many consumers are still confused, deeply confused. Providers split out programming fees so as to make them appear optional, when in reality they charge the broadcast television fee to all subscribers. Too many families are surprised by the bottom line price they end up paying for their monthly service. Too many experience that bill shock and have their monthly budgets blown up by unexpected line item fees. It's just simply like a lot of what we do here in, 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 um, at the FCC is about fairness, fundamental fairness. And generally, providers may choose to charge whatever price they believe the market will bear. But to keep that market robust and equitable, consumers must have the ability to make informed choices. And so by adopting the all-in rule here today, we're ensuring that they do, empowering them, as Commissioner Gomez said, empowering consumers uh, to uh, more easily make the comparison as they shop, choose the plan that is right for them. And so we're making sh sure that consumers can trust the deal that they believe they're entering into, and it's the one that they'll actually get. 
benefits uh, uh, the trust that we have here and will redound to consumers and providers alike. So thank you to the hard work of the staff. Uh, it has my support and, and um, the consumer kind of uh, focus that we have here at the agency is an important, important space and part of our core mission. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. Americans deserve to know what they're paying for their products. On that issue, I am aligned with my colleagues today who are voting to approve this item. Indeed, I asked my colleagues to implement a targeted edit to this item that I believe would have paved the way to a unanimous vote while still taking action to implement all-in pricing for cable billing. Leadership uh, rejected that edit in favor of the item presented today. Permit me to explain my thinking on my vote to dissent. Think of this item as a two-by-two two matrix for pricing disclosure requirements, sort of like a Punnett square. At the top, you have billing and promotional materials. On the side, you have cable and satellite video providers. The Commission's authority today only even arguably covers one of the four quadrants of this matrix, that is cable billing. Satellite billing is a harder lift. Cable and satellite promotional material pricing disclosure requirements are fully without authority. While I would have had reservations with the particular way in which the item implements cable billing pricing requirements, at least we can do so under the TVPA. I'm happy to concede that point. Section 642 empowers the Commission to act on cable billing practices, including to regulate how pricing is denominated therein. While I do not necessarily agree with the particular approach in today's item in implementing the all-in pricing disclosure requirement, at least our authority over some aspects of cable billing is uh, quite clear. The rest of the item, however, the rest of our uh, toy little management consulting or uh, auto buying uh, consultant matrix is just analytical error. We lack authority under Section 335A to require satellite operators to change their bills to reflect these new disclosures. But much, much more distressingly, there's no world in which Section 335A Section 632 or Section 642 empower the Commission to regulate price formatting on promotional materials. It's just not there. Section 632 relates to customer service rules for cable operators. While I will discuss why I'm skeptical of Section 632 authority as it relates to billing in a moment, there's clearly no language indicating that Section 632 can extend to non-subscribers, as most of those targeted by promotional materials are. Nor could a promotional material plausibly be read to be a so-called communication between the cable operator and the subscriber, unquote, within the meaning of Section 632, which relates to already extant relationships between cable operators and their subscribers. While some subscribers will inevitably see promotions for service from their current video provider, those are not communications within the meaning of Section 632, which clearly relates to the sort of communications pertinent to the specific and existing relationship between a cable operator and, and customer. It strains the tensile strength of communication when read in the context of the whole of Section 632 to suggest otherwise. And the argument provided in the item that there is some sort of general grant of authority under Section 632 for the Commission to establish customer service requirements for cable operators that is read out when the language is narrowed so as to apply to cable customers. It's an absurdity. I can't get there. There's no general grant of authority under Section 632 that was ever intended to govern the relationship between a cable operator and a non-customer, so there's no authority as it relates to promotional materials in this section. Section 335A relates essentially to the provision of political programming. While my colleagues rely on the sentence empowering the Commission to impose, quote, public interest or other requirements for video programming, unquote, on satellite video providers, the very next sentence indicates that, quote, any regulations prescribed pursuant to such rulemaking shall, at a minimum, apply to um, access to advertising time for candidates for political office. This would seem to indicate that the domain to which our public interest regulations were intended to, uh, to apply and the rest of the section does nothing to undercut the basic principle that the thrust of the section is about public service programming carriage. The bare existence of the presence of the term public interest does not entitle a reading that is fully contrary to context. Indeed, the item suggests that its reading of this section is clear in common sense, yet just as had Congress intended to extend Section 335A to cover how satellite providers advertise their prices or bill their customers, they presumably uh, would have said so by any words other than public interest, even one additional word. It's in no way clear, nor is it common sense, at least not to me, that the Commission is entitled to impute meaning into a statute that Congress clearly could have included, but legislative history makes clear that it elected not to include. And then there is the TVPA. As recently as 2019, Congress considered and explicitly rejected extending Commission authority to regulate promotional materials when passing the TVPA. 
ought that not to be a clear indicator as to what clarity and common sense demand when reading congressional intent as to what the Act says in sections passed years earlier? Had the Commission authority to act today under Section 335A or Section 632 to act as it relates to, to cable or satellite billing or promotional materials, well, then for what purpose was the TVPA passed? It would seem to me that the very existence of the TVPA indicates clearly the precise boundaries Congress intended to draw as it relates to linear video billing and pricing disclosures and the Commission's authority to act thereon. What's left to implement these requirements? The authority of the gunslinger. Section 4.1 ancillary, sorry, 4i ancillary authority. Suffice it to say, I do not find the exercise of Section 4i authority in any way related to the effective performance of our statutorily mandated responsibilities, since this item is purely voluntary on the Commission's part. The full rejection of ancillary authority, I will leave as an exercise for the litigant. So our authority to act is weak where it exists at all, but is today's item a good idea? Well, in some respects, sure. Okay, all in video pricing on my bill in some respects. Now, instead of a few lines on my monthly bill, I have one. Maybe I'm a young and savvy consumer who is on the fence about cord cutting. Maybe this revision looks a little techy, or the all-in price is a punchy serif font or something like that. At any rate, I appreciate the aesthetics of a single line item for my video package. Maybe I stay an additional year, because that single line item helps me do a little back-of-the-envelope comparison shopping, and I determine if I'm actually doing all right with my traditional provider by comparison to a bundle of streaming services. This probably isn't so bad pro-consumer. Yet, the new rules are less great in other respects, like when instead of a few lines on my monthly bill, I have one. And this time I'm an older consumer with a legacy plan that has provided me a bill in the same format for the last decade. Now it looks like I'm being charged more. Now I'm calling my cable company or my grandchild to explain. This probably isn't as good. And then not good at all, of course, is that we are yet again adding additional regulatory burden and complexity on an industry that is presently shedding customers by the millions. Traditional linear video is on the way out, but we don't have to shoo them away like the last guest who hasn't gotten a hint that the party's over. For every mote of regulatory complexity, we add to legacy providers, unregulated online video providers become more nimble by comparison. While an argument can be made for consumer benefit for all-in pricing on billing, although if I were to guess, I think it will largely wind up being a push, we lack the authority to do most of what we did in this item, and we have very little hope of prevailing on promotional materials if challenged. For those reasons and for the general good of the order, in the hopes that we can one day soon stop treating media regulation like a term paper word count minimum we have to meet, I dissent. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Gomez. Thank you. This item brings together two issues I care deeply about, competition and empowering consumers. I'm a firm believer in the power of competition to drive innovation that improves services and lowers prices for consumers. I'm also focused on understanding how the FCC's actions impact consumers and where outreach, education, and engagement can make a difference in their lives. Innovation in the video ecosystem is constantly evolving. Competition is intense, and consumers have so many choices, it can be overwhelming. But today we take action to help consumers navigate this complex marketplace by ensuring that cable and satellite video programming service providers disclose a single all-in price that includes all charges for video services. This may sound simple, but there are significant charges that are often a surprise to many of us when the bill finally arrives. This all-in price will provide consumers with the facts they need up front to compare service offerings on an apples to apples basis and make informed choices. Knowledge is empowering. I'm happy to support this important item and thank you to the Media Bureau team for all your hard work. And now I'd like to share brief comments in Spanish. La innovación en el ecosistema del video evoluciona constantemente. La competencia es intensa y los consumidores tienen tantas opciones que pueden resultar abrumadoras. Y cuando llega la factura, nos podemos confundir. Hoy la FCC toma medidas para ayudar a los consumidores a navegar este complejo mercado garantizando que los proveedores de servicios de programación de video por cable y satélite revelen un precio único que incluya todos los cargos por los servicios de video. Esto puede parecer simple, pero hay cargos importantes que a menudo son una sorpresa para muchos de nosotros cuando finalmente llega la factura. Este precio, todo incluido, brindará a los consumidores los datos que necesitan 
desde el principio para comparar las ofertas de servicios similares y tomar decisiones informadas. El conocimiento nos da poder. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Across the economy, consumers are frustrated with junk fees. They're tired of seeing one advertised price and then paying something different when the bill arrives. They're fed up with special surcharges, line items, and tacked on costs. That is why nearly four out of five people in this country support federal legislation to crack down on junk fees. It's really no surprise because these fees make it hard to contrast like services and can quickly turn what seemed like a good deal into a not so good one. So today at the Federal Communications Commission, we're doing something simple to address this problem. We are requiring cable and satellite television providers to state clearly the all-in price consumers pay for video services. No one likes surprises on their bill. The advertised price for a service should be the price you pay when your bill arrives. It shouldn't include a bunch of unexpected junk fees that are separate from the top line price you were told when you signed up. But right now, this isn't the case. In fact, our record in this proceeding demonstrates that 24 to 33 percent of consumer bills are special fees like broadcast subscription and regional sports assessments. It's not just annoying. It makes it hard for consumers to compare services in a market that is evolving and has so many new ways to watch. This effort to cut down on junk fees on consumer bills is part of a larger initiative at this agency. In fact, next month, broadband providers will be rolling out new broadband nutrition labels with easy to understand facts about service plans that are gonna help improve transparency and competition. We've also proposed rules to limit unfair early termination fees, which can restrict consumer choice. On top of that, we've put forward rules to grant prorated credits or rebates for the remaining days in a billing cycle after the cancellation of service. The bottom line is we do not have to have junk fees. We can have bills that are both transparent and fair. This is a step in that direction, and it is good news for consumers. So I want to thank the team responsible for this effort, which is small but mighty. And that's Holly Sauer, Lori Morbier, Maria Morlarkey, Brendan Murray, and Joseph Price of the Media Bureau, Andrew Wise and Kim Makuch of the Office of Economics and Analytics, Susan Aaron and Dave Consell of the Office of General Counsel, Jocelyn James of the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, and Kathy Williams of the Office of Managing Director. And with that, we will take a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Dissent. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Dissent. Commissioner Gomez. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, the fifth and final item on your agenda today is titled Wireless Emergency Alerts, Amendments to Part 11 of the Commission's rules regarding the emergency alert system and will be presented by the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Alejandro Rourke, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Good morning. Uh, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, um, today I am pleased to introduce on behalf of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau an item that if adopted would start a proceeding to revise our emergency alert system rules to create a new event code for missing, endangered, or abducted persons. Specifically, the item before you would seek comment on the creation of missing and endangered persons, or MEP, event code to help law enforcement efforts to find missing and endangered adults, similar to how Amber Alerts help find missing children. The Emergency Alert System MEP event code proposed in this item would assist law enforcement agencies in establishing a nationwide communications network to issue a Shanti alert related to missing and endangered adults, similar to how the Child Abduction Emergency, or CAE, event code is used to trigger AMBER alerts to help missing and locate uh, children. This initiative would be particularly beneficial to efforts to find the thousands of missing Native and Indigenous persons um, who have disappeared from their homes and will help build on efforts to collect data on missing Native and Indigenous persons' cases. 
Before uh, turning the presentation over to the Bureau staff, I would like to thank the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau and the Offices of Communications, Business Opportunities, Economics and Analytics, uh, the General Counsel for their valuable assistance, and a special thank you to the Office of Native Affairs and Policy for all of their work to bring the benefits of modern communications to all Native communities. Joining me at the table today are Wes Platt, Chief, and Dana Bowers, Associate Chief in CGB's Consumer Policy Division, and Dana Bowers will present the item. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The Emergency Alert System, or EAS, and Wireless Emergency Alerts, or WEA, system distributes tens of thousands of warnings to the public every year. These systems provide critical information about emergencies ranging from severe weather events, such as tornadoes and hurricanes, to natural disasters, such as tsunamis and wildfires, to civil emergencies, such as missing children and police officers. These systems have been instrumental in the successful recovery of missing and endangered children through the use of dedicated event code for child abduction emergencies that trigger AMBER alerts. The notice of proposed rulemaking before you, if adopted, would seek to replicate the success for missing and endangered adults. The notice of proposed rulemaking, proposed rulemaking would propose and seek comment on establishing a new event code, or MEP, to facilitate more efficient and widespread dissemination of alerts and coordinated responses to incidents involving missing and endangered persons. In 2022, approximately 187,000 adults who fell outside the criteria for AMBER alerts went missing in the United States. Regional guidance exists in some places for emergency alerts in these cases, but there is no uniformity in how the alerts are named, activated, or implemented. The Ashanti Alert Act, enacted in 2018, requires the establishment of a national network to provide assistance to search efforts in such cases, an objective this item's proposal could help further. Notably, the proposed event code could be particularly beneficial to tribal communities. American Indian and Alaska Native people are at a disproportionate risk of experiencing violence, murder, or vanishing. That's why in 2020, Congress passed both Savannah's Act and the Not Invisible Act to highlight the need for increased law enforcement coordination in addressing violent crimes against American Indians and Alaska Natives. And in 2023, a resolution adopted by the National Congress of American Indians called upon the Commission to establish an MEP event code to enable a more rapid and coordinated response to incidents involving missing indigenous persons. Establishing a dedicated event code for missing and endangered person alerts could help create uniformity in the alert process to locate such individuals and facilitate the rapid dissemination of information about adults who have been reported missing to law enforcement agencies, media, and the public. This notice of proposed rulemaking would advance these important public policy interests by proposing to amend Section 11, TAC 31E of the Commission's EAS rules to add a new MEP event code for missing and endangered person incidents. This proposal anticipates that such an event code would be used to disseminate information based on three criteria. One, individuals over the age of 17. Two, missing adults who have special needs or circumstances. And three, missing adults who are endangered or have been abducted or kidnapped. The item would also seek comment on a number of issues related to the proposal, such as the time frame in which a dedicated alert code for missing and endangered persons could be implemented, and whether doing so could implicate particular privacy or other civil liberty concerns that the Commission should consider. The Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau recommends the adoption of this notice of proposed route making and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowers and Mr. Roark. Now, before we hear comments from the bench, I want to welcome a special guest to our open meeting to provide some brief testimony and some insight. Thanks to the power of modern communications, we are virtually joined by Loris Taylor, who is a proud citizen of the Hopi Nation and has led Native Public Media as president and CEO since 2004. Last year, Native Public Media sponsored a resolution at the National Congress of American Indians Convention calling on us, the FCC, to establish a missing and endangered persons alert code. And so we welcome her testimony on this important issue. Ms. Taylor, please proceed. Good day, Chair Rosen Warsel and commissioners. Native Public Media is a nonprofit organization serving American Indian and Alaska Native Villages through media and communications. 60 radio and three television stations make up the Native Broadcast Network. Advocating for policies that utilize broadcast and broadband assets and support tribal communities is our mission. 
technologists that include the integrated public alert and warning system, emergency alert system, and wireless emergency alerts. But let me tell you why this issue is important to me. On the Hopi Reservation in Northeastern Arizona, my mother's younger brother was last seen on September 1st, 2013. My uncle, Eugene Vernon Kalnemtua, left the Kikotsmovi Village store after work. The store's video captured his image at 7.12 p.m. as he walked out the door. He was reported missing 10 days later. Searches were conducted by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Hopi Resource Enforcement Services. Eugene's information was placed in the National and Arizona Crime Information Centers. These two centers distribute missing alerts to other agencies. Flyers about Eugene were posted across the reservation. Eugene was never found alive. Ashley Loring Heavy Runner, 20 years old, disappeared from the Blackfeet Indian Reservation in Montana on June 5, 2017. Two weeks after Ashley was last seen, someone reported seeing a young woman running from a vehicle on U.S. Highway 89 the night Ashley disappeared. Ashley was enrolled in the Blackfeet Community College studying environmental science. Her family continues to search for her, and a walk is held in Browning, Montana every year. Her case remains open. 34-year-old Willis Derendoff was last seen on November 10, 2020, at a hotel in Fairbanks, Alaska. His mother, Gladys, said she spoke to Willis on the phone the day he disappeared. Gladys traveled from her home in Hooslia to Fairbanks and stayed there for eight months, organizing search parties and using Facebook to rally community members. His case is still open. A missing and endangered persons event code for adults could have made a difference for Eugene, Willis, and Ashley. Thousands of families have suffered similar traumas across Indian country and nationwide. In 2016, there were 5,712 reports of missing Native women and girls, but only 116 cases were logged in the Department of Justice database, according to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. In 2022, more than 10,000 Indigenous people were reported missing through the FBI's National Crime Information Center. That's a higher rate of disappearance than the general population, and these are only reported cases. The Missing and Endangered Person Resolution, sponsored by Native Public Media, endorsed by the National Congress of American Indians, and elected tribal leaders nationwide, underscores the critical need for an adult Missing and Endangered Person event code, particularly for addressing the pandemic across Indian country. The suffering is real and long-term, and today we have the collective opportunity and the technology to change the trajectory for families and communities across Indian country and the nation. Asquali Dawae, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor, for joining us today and inspiring us to act for change. And with that, we will hear from my colleagues, Commissioner Carr. Thank you. I do want to join the chair expressing my thanks and appreciation to you for that uh, important and moving uh, testimony. This is a action we're taking at the FCC that will fill a gap in the Amber Alert process and cover adults that fall outside of the Amber Alert, including because of their age, as we heard today, for people that are above the age of 17. So I want to support the, the work that everyone has done on this and it has my vote. Thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Ms. Taylor, for your testimony um, and, and more importantly for your passion, for your advocacy. Uh, it is important that we hear, um, you know, sponsoring the resolution for the National Congress there of American Indians uh, and helping to drive the mission and the work that we do here. Uh, you should be proud of that work, and uh, I'm proud to stand uh, stand with uh, with you here today. Um, you know, reading this item and reading it closely, uh, a number of you know the words that really jumped out at me were and really resonated with me were you know coordination, 
the need for additional uniformity, um, uh, in particular due to the kind of patchwork of alert systems that we have across jurisdictions. Uh, Senator Lujan himself uh, said, and I could not say it better, you know, we cannot let missing and endangered people fall through the gaps, and that's the uh, real goal of what we're doing here today, a uniform event code will help raise public awareness, uh, response, uh, and really help us um, uh, find and, and, and do better uh, by these folks who otherwise could be falling through the cracks. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. Thank you. I'm happy to support this notice proposing that the nation's emergency alert system be updated to support alerts for missing and endangered persons. The Amber Alert system has been a success, saving many lives, so I'm optimistic that we can replicate that for missing and kidnapped adults as well. Commissioner Gomez. This item includes a remarkable statistic from the Department of Justice that is worth repeating. Um, of the 181 Amber Alerts issued in 2022, 100, 181 Amber Alerts issued in 2022, 180 resulted in the recovery of a lost child. That's pretty amazing and encouraging. So today we begin the process to establish an emergency alert code dedicated to find adults that have gone missing. I want to join in thanking Loris Taylor um, for your very impactful remarks today. The public policy goal of this proposed rulemaking is to help communities and families that unfortunately experience the anguish of not knowing where their loved ones are. So this item represents a small but powerful contribution to address the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous persons, which has afflicted Native communities for far too long. Native Americans constitute 2.5 percent of all missing cases, missing person cases despite comprising only 1.2% of the population. With this proposal to establish an emergency alert code for missing persons, we hope to offer help. As I remarked at the annual Reservation Economic Summit yesterday, we want to hear from the public, public safety authorities, and from emergency response officials, how does this proposal help? We ask some important questions about how to implement this in a way that is most helpful to the communities. A heartfelt thank you to the staff from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau for your work on this critical life-saving item. And now, for the last time today, I'd like to offer my remarks in Spanish. Hoy comenzamos el proceso para establecer una nueva alerta de emergencia dedicada a ayudar a encontrar adultos que se han desaparecido. El objetivo de beneficio público de este proceso es de ayudar a las comunidades y familias que lamentablemente viven la angustia de no saber dónde están sus queridos queridos. Cuando se pierde un tío, una prima, un familiar, todos nos preocupamos. Hoy la Comisión Federal de Comunicaciones propone establecer esta nueva alerta de emergencia para ofrecer ayuda. Invito al público a que nos escriban y nos comenten cómo implementar este programa en la manera más útil para las comunidades. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to my colleagues for your support. At the Oscar ceremony this week, Killers of the Flower Moon was actually shut out of the awards. But this film accomplished something that I think is more important than racking up wins in Hollywood. It opened our eyes to the troubling fact that violence against Native women has a long history. It affects us to this day. The cruel reality is that we continue to have a crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous people, and it is especially acute for women and girls in tribal communities. The Bureau of Indian Affairs estimates there are more than 4,000 cases of missing and murdered American Indian and Alaska Natives that are totally unsolved. According to the FBI, the numbers missing are more than two and a half times their share of the United States population. And while there are new methods to collect data on missing and endangered tribal and native people, the true magnitude of this problem is hard to capture through the data we have alone. So this movie gave voice to this crisis, and Congress did too when in 2017 it established May 5th as the National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Native Women and Girls. 
Then in 2018, Congress passed the Ashanti Alert Act, which directs the Department of Justice to work more closely with state and local law enforcement agencies to help find missing and endangered adults. So these efforts are vital. But I think more work is needed to help address the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous people. And today, the Federal Communications Commission is stepping up to do just that. It was nearly three decades ago that Amber Alerts were created. They tell us on television and on our mobile phones when a child goes missing. So many young people have been safely found with these alerts. They demonstrate clearly that there is a way to raise awareness when someone goes missing and increase the odds that we safely find them. So today we propose a new code in our emergency alert systems for broadcasting and wireless that would sound the alarm when adults are missing and endangered to help raise awareness and support recovery. This is critical, especially for the indigenous women and girls who are at special risk. I want to thank the National Congress of American Indians for their work to pass a resolution to support the commission establishing the Snow Code. I also want to acknowledge the efforts of so many members of Congress who've brought attention to this issue over the last several years, and that includes Senator Lujan, Schatz, Danes, Tester, Murkowski, and Cortez Masto. Our work owes an absolutely enormous debt of gratitude to Native public media for um, bringing this issue to us, to our attention. So a really big thank you to Loris Taylor, who we are so honored to have here today. She said in a letter to us, and I want to quote, that by working collaboratively, we can make meaningful strides in addressing the challenges posed by the missing and murdered indigenous persons crisis and enhance the safety and well-being of indigenous peoples and American people in general. I totally agree, and we're going to get it done. Our work here today may not have the glamour of the Oscar ceremony, but it's absolutely essential because we're going to be able to save lives. Finally, I want to thank the staff who are responsible for this rulemaking, including Alejandro Roark, Mark Stone, Aaron Garza, Wesley Platt, Dana Bowers, Theo Marcus, Bambi Krause, and Kara Voth from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Nicole McGinnis, Austin Rondazzo, James Wiley, George Donato, Drew Morin, Dave Kirshner, and David Munson from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Joy Ragsdale, Jocelyn James, Jamie Salom, and Shauna Wilkerson from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, and Doug Klein, William Huber, Anjali Singh, and Erica Olson from the Office of the General Counsel. We will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. Commissioner Gomez. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Thank you again to Loris Taylor and Native Public Media for joining us today. We're going to get this done. All right. With that, we've come to the end. Would any of my colleagues like to make announcements at this time? Commissioner Carr, Commissioner Starks, Commissioner Symington, Commissioner Gomez. All right. I've got a few announcements. Let me start with some retirements. First, I want to announce the retirement of David Wright from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. He began his 34-year federal government career when he joined the Navy as a cryptologic technician, interpretive, and Russian linguist. He served on naval vessels as direct support operator and supervisor. He also served as a Russian language instructor to young sailors and Marines. And he supported a number of intelligence missions. Because of his achievements, the Navy bestowed on Dave the rank of chief petty officer. Now, following his stint in the Navy, he worked as a defense contractor. And then he joined us here at the FCC. He currently serves as the very first senior watch officer overseeing our daily operations of the Commission's High Frequency Direction Finding Center. And we run that out of Columbia, Maryland. Dave has contributed to thousands of high frequency uh, direction finding missions, helping to improve, um, to resolve interference, and making all kinds of discoveries that have supported US intelligence and law enforcement efforts. He even helped with the development of software to streamline and enhance the commission's capabilities and ensure the overall success of the commission's work with safety of life and national security missions. 
Dave's been a really vital member behind the scenes of the FCC team, and we wish him fair winds and following seas in the next chapter of his life. We have another retirement, and this one is from the Enforcement Bureau. Wayne Liang retired at the end of February after 17 years with the FCC as a field agent, and that was most recently in the Los Angeles field office. Wayne will be especially missed by the Enforcement Bureau colleagues and our Los Angeles troops, and they join me in wishing him well. And we have a third retirement announcement. This time, it's from the Office of Managing Director. Vanessa Lamb is retiring after a 40-year career in federal government. She got her start at the Defense Contract Auditing Agency, and then she worked for the Environmental Protection Agency, and then the United States Postal Service before finding her home here at the FCC. She contributed so much to the operation of the Office of Managing Director. She worked for financial operations and the performance evaluations and record management team, and more recently has overseen all the FCC's processes related to FOIA, records management, the Paperwork Reduction Act, the Congressional Review Act, and Federal Advisory Committee management. And anyone who's worked on any of those things knows there are some complex laws to manage and follow. So good luck to you, Vanessa, in retirement. We, we will miss you, and uh, we wish you all the best. Our fourth and final retirement announcement today is Hillary Burchuk from the FCC's Office of Inspector General, who is retiring after 34 years of federal service. She began her legal career as a trial attorney in the civil and tax divisions of the Department of Justice. When she left government service, Hillary began her career in telecommunications when she joined this upstart called MCI as a civil and bankruptcy litigator. Then she returned to the Justice Department, this time as a trial attorney in the Telecommunications Task Force of the Antitrust Division. And while she was there, she worked with a whole bunch of people at the FCC who, in a little bit down the road, were able to convince her to come over and join us in the FCC's Office of General Counsel, where she worked on litigation and bankruptcy matters. She later joined the Enforcement Bureau, then the Office of the Office of Inspector General as Deputy Assistant Inspector General for Investigations. And for the last year, she's been the Acting Assistant Inspector General for Investigations. And in 2023, her work leading an investigation was honored with an award of excellence by the Council of Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency. So her colleagues are going to miss her tremendously, her demonstration to her mission. And when I asked for something about her, they told me that they're going to miss especially her contributions to their celebrations, because she is responsible for pie cake in. Anyone know? What yeah, I didn't know either. Well, you're going to want one. A pie, yeah, a pie, a pie baked inside a chocolate cake smothered in chocolate frosting. So yeah, we're going to miss Hillary. Um, and uh, we know in her retirement plans, she wants to spend more time with family and friends and also play the bassoon in amateur orchestras, which she does in the DC area and also abroad in Italy. And finally, I want to acknowledge uh, with all these goings, some comings. We've got some additions to our Office of Media Relations. Raven Hill joined our media relations team this week as co-deputy director. She comes to us from the Maryland State Department of Education and brings expertise in media relations, writing and editing, and strategic communications. And she points out that both of her parents were career federal government employees. The office has also recently added Becky Lockhart, Laura Nichols, and Jason Schiavone to work on different aspects of digital media, web content, and outreach. And I just want to offer a really hearty welcome to all our new staff. All right. It's lunchtime. <laughs> Madam Secretary, will you please announce the next date for the Commission's monthly agenda meeting? The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Until then, we stand adjourned. Hi, everyone. If you can please take your conversations outside, we really appreciate it, or take a seat. Again, we'd like to ask everyone to take your conversations outside or take a seat. We're about to begin the post-open meeting 
press conference with Chairwoman Rosen Marshall. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, for those who may not know me, my name is Jonathan Uriarte. I'm the Chairwoman's Director of Communications, Strategic Communications. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start the post open meeting press conference. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce Chairwoman Rosen Marshall. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's late today. We did a lot. All right, let's get started. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we wanted to ask about, uh, there was a Congressional Review Act resolution introduced, as I'm sure you know, uh, earlier by uh, Cruz and Lee on uh, the anti-discrimination rule. I was wondering if we could get a response to you from that filing. Um, I have confidence in the work of the Federal Communications Commission on these matters and that our work is consistent with the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, hi, Chairwoman. Monty Taylor, Com Daily. Um, uh, Representative Mike Gallagher wrote you earlier this week asking the FCC to take action on reports that mobile devices in the U.S. are still processing signals from China's Beidou, I might not be saying that right, and Russia's global navigation satellite systems. Do you have any updates on what you're going to do with that? It is already the subject of an ongoing investigation. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Chairwoman. Sarah Friedman, Inside Cybersecurity. I wanted to see if you could elaborate on how you plan to work with other agencies on the uh, IoT cybersecurity labeling program, and if there's effort, efforts on reciprocity when it comes to the White House and other um, agencies. Uh, we absolutely believe that this, the US cyber trust mark will succeed if it's a collaborative effort. We are building this program on the well-respected work of NIST, and in particular, NIST cybersecurity criteria. We are willing and able to work with other agencies with an interest in this area, and we have also worked with the administration to make sure that we have mutual recognition with authorities in Europe that are interested in some of these same matters. By acting now and getting this program underway, it's my hope we can develop something that will become the global standard. All right. Thanks, all. Madam Chairwoman, um, so we're going to do the Bureau press conference next. Uh, so if you guys have questions on the items that were adopted today, uh, let's go through the list. Let me know if you have any questions, and we'll call up the teams. Um, do you have any questions on the Internet of Things item? Okay. Public Safety Bureau? The Public Safety Bureau. <laughs> um, Sarah, do you want to go first? Yes. I wanted to ask you about the further notice of proposed rulemaking. Um, can you elaborate on what's going to be in that and there will be anything addressing software um, liability concerns or preemption when it comes to other states? So we are looking, uh, as was mentioned, at software uh, or hardware that is coming from countries of concern, of national security concern, uh, as well as whether um, U.S. citizens' data will be stored abroad. And so you'll be able to see the details when the item's released, but that's it at a high level. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, any changes that were made from the draft version? Um, so the further notice that mm -hmm. we just talked about right. uh, is probably the most most significant. Uh, we did also do some edits based on ex parte's feedback uh, we received, and, and you'll see them in the item as it's released. Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to ask if there was any consideration of making any of the NIST standards compulsory. There have been various uh, ex parte filed saying make sure everything is voluntary in this program. So the participation in the program is voluntary, um, but in order to receive the trust mark, the products must comply with the NIST criteria for which we envision the development of standards that will be enforced. So. So the criteria will be mandatory, but the participation is voluntary. Any other questions on this item? Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. And do we have any questions on the 706 report? Monty? Uh, 
I have the very exciting question. Uh, can you tell us about any edits made to the final draft? Or yes, from thank, the draft? Thank you for the uh, question. So um, we updated the list of accomplishments that the agency had made, and we also had a couple of ex partes where we responded to them, and that's, those are the differences that you'll see. Any questions on the supplemental coverage from Space Item? Okay, Space Bureau and Wireline, Wireless Bureau, sorry. Some of them. I'm gonna take a wild guess what the first question is. <laughs> I can phrase it differently if you want to. <laughs> Does the does the final version look different than the original version, and how so? <laughs> Thank you for the creative phrasing. Um, uh, I would say that there there were some uh, changes at the margins to reflect uh, stakeholder input and and um, uh, some input from the commissioners, but no no significant bottom line changes. Any other questions on this item? Thank you. Thank you. And all in pricing, same question, Monty. Uh, Media Bureau. Yes, Monty, how can I help you? I have kind of a different one, a little bit. Um, okay. I was told to ask, uh, did you ha did you make any changes to the implement implementation deadline? I know uh, ACA, DirecTV, were pushing for that. Yes, we did make a change to the implementation deadline. There, we extended it for small cable operators to be 12 months. And then my predictable question, other than that, are there many changes? Yes, uh, in response to requests from the offices and uh, ex parte's we received, we uh, clarified the promotional requirements, the roll-off notification requirements, and the PEG and franchise fee classifications. Any other questions on this item? Thank you. All right. And any questions on um, the emergency alert item? Great. CGB? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if there were any changes. Did you add any additional questions or anything come in from the commissioners? Um, you know, definitely always a very collaborative process, and we engage with all stakeholders to ensure that, you know, we struck the right balance here. But nothing, I think, uh, worth noting beyond the fact that we really were, we're all focused on making sure that we, getting it, that we get it right. Yeah. Any other questions on this item? Great. Thank you. Thanks. With that, I think uh, Commissioner Carr is here, so I'll hand it off to him. Thank you all very much. Thanks, good to see you all. Uh, good week. Very glad to see the House pass their targeted TikTok bill. That's a really important step forward for America's national security. As I indicated from the dais, we've been taking action across multiple levels of the internet ecosystem, from devices and gear to carrier, and now getting an action on the application level is an important step. Turning back to uh, the FCC in particular, earlier this week, as you probably saw the Biden administration released its Spectrum implementation plan. This is a follow-on to last year's Spectrum strategy that they released. As I noted at the time when they released the Spectrum strategy, they made abundantly clear there uh, that they were just going to kick the can down the road when it, came, when it comes to Spectrum, which, as I noted, is a mistake because we are falling further and further behind our global competitors on one of the key drivers of economic growth and opportunity, which is Spectrum, where so much innovation is taking place. That was the Spectrum strategy, high-level document from last year. 
This week, the administration released its Spectrum plan, which tells you exactly what they're going to do with the strategy, and it made clear that, yes, in fact, they're going to kick the can down the road on Spectrum. I think it's a mistake. I think we need to start turning things around, again, both for our geopolitical leadership, but also as a matter of connectivity. So with that, happy to take your questions. Reserving time, demurs. I'll start. Hi, can I, hi, hi Commissioner. Um, this spec, Spectrum Pipeline Act, a GOP bill that was just introduced, why is there any reason to think that that will gain traction when a uh, uh, clean spectrum auction bill uh, hasn't passed in a year? Yeah, I think the work that Senator Cruz did as ranking member, Senator Thune has done, and Senator Blackburn is a really smart path forward. I think one of the challenges to a clean reauthorization of FCC's authority, not the only one, one of them has been the lack of a clear articulation uh, of a path forward for what the FCC would do if it had special auction authority. So one of the things that the Cruz, Thune, Blackburn approach does is it lays out you know, a very concrete path forward for spectrum bands that would come up and be moved out. And I think that that is sort of one key differentiator from the effort, uh, which I support, to reauthorize the FCC's spectrum auction authority as a general matter. So I think the targeted nature of it in terms of spectrum bands and specific megahertz, um, I think all of that work that they've done um, is different than some of the other approaches we've seen when it comes, again, to just efforts for pure reauthorization authority. Um, I think it's a great sign, and that really should be the, the model going forward. That is an actual spectrum plan that we should follow. Are you doing anything to try to change former President Trump's mind about banning TikTok? Are you talking to him or, I don't know, writing him letters or what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've not uh, spoken to, to President Trump. Um, and look, I think when you step back, what President Trump did to fundamentally reorient D.C. around the serious threat posed by communist China um, is one of the lasting important contributions uh, from 2017 to 2020. Um, TikTok very clearly poses a clear and present danger. Um, I think that's a point that is, at this point, almost uni universally agreed upon. But not by him. I'm not sure that that's exactly right. Fair enough. So in 2020, President Trump moved forward with the ban of TikTok. And what I've heard recently has been the President has talked about Facebook and sort of the accumulation of power and control that Facebook has. And that's a concern that I very much share. You know, President Trump put forward the ideas of Section 230 reform and actually had a petition filed here at the FCC. I put out a comment saying that we should do that. So the concern expressed about amassing more power in U.S. Silicon Valley and in Facebook in particular is one that we do need to address. And I think the way to do that is through Section 230 reform and through some of the other ideas that I've put out there in terms of affirmative anti-discrimination. Again, some of the concerns I've heard as well has been, should we look more broadly at privacy laws and about data flow laws more generally? I think we should. The issue with TikTok, however, is their own conduct has shown that until the tie is broken back to the CCP, the privacy and data flow types of laws are going to be ineffective. How do we know that? After TikTok was caught red-handed, having U.S. user data accessible inside China, not just some, but according to leaked internal materials, everything is seen in China, they said, okay, we're going to correct our ways. Then they came out and said, we're not surveilling the location of specific Americans. Then they had to come out and say, no, in fact, we are doing that. And they said, okay, okay, that's it. We're really going to correct course this time. We're putting up a wall, including through Project Texas, to separate U.S. user data from personnel in Beijing. Wall Street Journal story came out and showed no, in fact, personnel in Beijing, which their personnel in Beijing include members of the CCP, are still getting access to sensitive U.S. user data. So, yes, we need 
privacy laws in this country, improved ones. Yes, I would support data flow restrictions. And in fact, a data flow restriction law would largely land us in the same spot because TikTok has said they can't really operate as beholden to the CCP without data flows going back there. But until you break that tie to the CCP, then privacy laws aren't going to be enough because they ultimately are designed at solving two separate problems. Another piece of evidence here is Europe, right? Europe has some of the toughest data privacy laws in the world. Some people think they're too tough. But the EU had to separately take action to ban TikTok from official government devices, which tells you, once again, privacy laws and national security actions are directed at two different things. If it was otherwise, then Europe's data flow laws would have been enough to deal with TikTok. They wouldn't have had to take a specific action. So I agree with President Trump that we need to take a look at Silicon Valley and the accumulation of power there. I agree with others that have said we need to take a hard look at data flow legislation. And I think what you see is sort of really bipartisan consensus at this point that TikTok presents a clear and present danger and requires some action. When it comes to the IoT lab labeling program, do you think there's an opportunity for it to become mandatory? And what do you think um, changes, are there any changes that need to be uh, um, established in the program to address vulnerability disclosure? Yeah, I really like where we ended up landing on this. Again, this was something that uh, in the main, you know, the chair led on, coupled with Commissioner Symington to get some really good edits at the end of the day to the item. And I think the voluntary nature of this program is the right place to be. I haven't put thought into whether uh, mandatory is right here or even legal authority questions of whether we could go that route. Uh, I've been told to ask you if you have any reaction to Commissioner Symington's comments about the Section 706 report excluding satellite service. And did the final report have any of the changes you were trying to have? So my view on that same point, which is the FCC's discussion in 706 of satellite, is that, yes, the FCC made a serious mistake there. You know, on the one hand, you know, we are emphasizing here, rightly so, in this building, the technological pivot towards space. And that includes, obviously, a big part of it is the provision of new high-speed internet service from LEO systems. But what we did in this order was effectively read that out and not treat it as broadband the same way we would with the same types of broadband being provided with other technologies. And so I agree that that was a mistake. And again, the most fundamental mistake I thought we made in this year's 706 um, as a data matter was using version 2 rather than version 3, uh, version 2 being 15 months old at this point in time. And on the satellite point, you know, there was something like a 500% increase in the availability of high-speed service from LEO systems between version 2 and version 3. And so I really think we should have made this decision based on 3. But as I indicated sort of at the opening of that statement, I, I think there's more sort of macro, bigger picture things that are going on these days with the 706 report that really don't have to do with providing Congress with an accurate assessment of the, the pace and cadence of broadband builds. Okay, thanks all. Good to see you.